Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, Child and Teen Development Specialist, author and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but we're in this together, and we have some great people helping us along the way. Now, I ask an audience of parents to shout out some of the most annoying behaviors their children exhibit that they desperately want to get rid of. There won't be lack of answers from fighting and hitting to getting up from the table, getting out of bed, making a mess, whining, talking back. Parents have a bunch of challenges that they're trying to solve to make their family homes more peaceful, their mornings or evening routines easier, and their kids more cooperative and responsible. But what if I told you that the strategies we often employ to deal with these frustrating behaviors are, well, wrong? From nagging to judging, correcting, timeouts, reminding, lecturing, and saving, our strategies might just be mere band-aids or the very things that are making the behaviors worse. And what if there were actually strategies governed by a key parenting philosophy that could make it all much, much better? and help our kids to become confident, competent, responsible members of society. What in the world would this magical philosophy be and what makes it work so well? Well, you might be surprised by the answer. It's duct tape. Mm -hmm. Vicki Hofel is a popular parent educator, speaker, and author of Duct Tape Parenting, a less is more approach to raising respectful, responsible, and resilient kids, and the straight talk on parenting, a no-nonsense approach on how to grow a grown-up. She has helped thousands of families for over two decades by sharing her parenting tips and techniques across the country. She combines her expertise of Adlerian psychology with a suite of actionable, time-tested tools. A master storyteller who's part comedian, part sage, mostly parent, Vicki offers ways to strengthen and enhance the parent-child relationship and bring out the best in each parent, the best in each child, and the best in each encounter. Vicki Hofel leads parent education programs nationwide. Her parenting philosophy and approach to raising thinking children does not include getting children to comply or use a so-called discipline strategy, maybe nagging or reminding, lecturing, bribing, counting, or time outing, but it's not that way for dealing with pesky behaviors. Her strategies work for every family, and I'm so excited to help you and get everybody out there to hear about them because it's a really interesting philosophy and such a great way to help our kids grow up to be competent, responsible people. So I am so excited to have Vicki Hofel on the show. So welcome, Vicki, to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Before we get into the meat of the matter, for those who haven't gotten their hands on your book, Duct Tape Parenting, or heard you speak about your methods and your philosophy, can you tell us what gets you up in the morning and what got you so interested in helping parents find a new approach to parenting that didn't involve nagging and punishing and did involve strategies that really help kids grow up to be competent adults? I would love to talk about that because it's a story that kind of um, weaves together my own experience as a brand new mother with a passion that I found later in life as the result of being a mom. And that's what gets me out of bed every morning. Mm. So um, when I was uh, newly pregnant with my oldest daughter, I realized early on that I probably did not have the character traits and attributes that would make for great parenting. Mm -hmm. I am stubborn and bossy and opinionated and impatient. And truth be told, I really believe that I should be in charge of the entire universe. <laughs> I didn't think those were the qualities that were going to make for a, a healthy environment to raise my kids in. And so I spent a lot of time 
early on in the pregnancy, trying to find a philosophy that really resonated with me. And I did a lot of research. I read a lot of books and I was lucky enough to stumble on a book written by the Dink Myers called Systematic Training for Effective Parenting. And there was something so powerful that resonated with me because it was about human relationships rather than the parent-child relationship. And what that meant to me was that if I learned about this philosophy and the strategies and the techniques that they um, recommended, that I would have something that grew along with my children. So I wouldn't have to keep updating my suite of strategies. I could, the things that I tried when my kids were two would also work when my kids were 12 and 22. Mm -hmm. And that really felt like something I could embrace, a philosophy that I could embrace that would grow with me and grow with the kids and wouldn't get me locked into thinking about how I was going to change my children, but rather how would I create an environment what, that was conducive to them being their best selves. And it worked mm -hmm. for me as a mom with young children. And it wasn't long before some of my friends started to ask me, why I wasn't fighting all the time with my kids, why my children weren't screaming back at me. And that became my passion was to share what I learned because I, I figured if I could do it, anybody could do it. Mm. Um, and that is what gets me out of bed every single morning. Well, I'm so appreciative of you stumbling on that book. I can say that while reading your book, with a pen in my hand, circling things, writing things in, to, in, in the margins and, and underlining that I certainly got a lot out of the way that you, you approach parenting. I love it. Now you admit in your book what most of us are thinking, that parenting is challenging on a good day. Many parents are looking for what we would think of as quick fixes. Um, they might employ one strategy after another, do what's always been done or do what their parents did or use what their neighbor does or their best friend does, hoping that at some point they aren't going to be the one who's yelling and correcting and punishing and guilting or putting their children in timeout but not knowing if that day will ever come. And some of them just assume someday it will just magically disappear. So they find themselves day after day giving the same lectures or jumping in to save their child or threatening or even punishing. And you say that this is not what works to create competent, responsible kids, and it will never work in the long run. You say the answer is duct tape. So what is duct tape parenting? And what are the biggest hurdles to this style of parenting for those who are just hearing about it or trying to employ it? So I'll tell you what the biggest hurdle is initially, is that when parents read duct tape parenting, what they equate that to is them not doing anything, mm -hmm. kind of giving control of the home to the kids and nothing could be further from the truth. It's really about doing less of what doesn't work and more of what does so that you get more positive change in your family. So it's really about simplifying, getting rid of all of those strategies that are age appropriate, but don't really grow with your child. Um, it's, it's getting rid of the strategies that worked for someone else with their children, but you haven't had any success in it. And it's really at the center of it, it's about trusting yourself as a parent and knowing that you are the expert in your child's life. But in order to be that expert, to really gain confidence in being the expert, we have to learn to listen to our children differently because they are always trying to inform us either through their behavior or the words that they use. So duct tape parenting is was quite literally an accident because um, with three young children and I was newly divorced and suddenly my mouth was going like, you know, rapid fire. <laughs> I, was, I was dictating and, and nagging and reminding and, and uh, I mean, it was, a, you can imagine, it was an absolute mess. And my kids were shutting down. It, they were spending less and less time with me. There were more power struggles. And I got really scared that I was going to lose all this great work that I had done um, early on in their lives. And in a moment of complete surrender, 
I went to the tool shed and I got a roll of duct tape and I thought I have got to control my mouth and I don't have the discipline to do it. So the duct tape is going to do it for me. And I slapped a piece over my mouth one morning and it was magic. Mm -hmm. As I stopped talking, my children's brains turned on. Mm -hmm. They had to look around their world and assess what needed to be done next. And this was first thing in the morning before we left for school. And I watched as my children started to show me all of the things that they knew how to do that I had been badgering them about. And I realized that every time I talked, their brains shut down and they relied on me to navigate the next situation. And that might sound like a lovely thing, but when you turn over control of your life to someone else, no matter how old you are, there's a, there's a certain amount of resentment that comes with that. And in young children, that resentment turns into power struggles. Mm -hmm. It gets labeled snarky and disrespectful attitudes. But in fact, it's our children saying to us, please, please give me a minute to try this out, to figure it out on my own, to make a mistake and, and learn from that mistake until I finally really understand this situation and I can bring my best self to it. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I made a commitment to myself and my family that whenever my mouth got out of control, I would grab the duct tape and put it back on and restore a sense of balance in the family. Mm -hmm. And um, I have five grown children now and I still have the duct tape handy mm. because when they call my propensity is still to try and kind of manage their lives for them mm -hmm. um, so it has been a very handy tool for the mm. last 30 years yeah so interesting and and this whole idea of less is more uh it, it's it's such an important idea as we are trying to raise kids who can do these things as uh, older kids and as adults. And it doesn't magically happen. As you say in your book, they have to actually make those mistakes. They actually have to do the tasks. They have to figure it out. Now you talk about an exercise that you use with audiences where you ask them to shout out frustrating behaviors and then their strategies for correcting it. And you discuss that these frustrating behaviors, this whining or fighting or uh, poking at other, you know, the other kid are actually weeds. And the strategies that we are using is not actually weed killer as we might think, but actually fertilizer. Correct. So can you talk more about that metaphor and what we can do instead of the typical behaviors or the typical strategies that we might use um, in, in some typical situations. Yes, absolutely. So if you're a parent and you're listening, I want to invite you to get a piece of paper and a pen right now and um, make uh, two columns. And in the left column, to write down all the things your kids do that drive you crazy, all the pesky behavior that you think to yourself, oh, if you would just stop doing that, life would be so wonderful, my <laughs> darling. And it could be anything from whining, picking on your brother, snarky attitudes, hitting, biting, not getting up with the alarm clock, not hanging your coat up. It doesn't matter. Write it all down. On that left side, I always refer to those as just the pesky behaviors. They're not bad behaviors. They're just the things that kind of disrupt family life. And then on the right side of the paper, write down all the ways that you try and manage those pesky behaviors. And in my 30 years, uh, it's almost always the same list. Well, I remind, I bribe, I yell, I threaten, I coax, I give in, I save, <laughs> I consequence. Mm -hmm. And, and, it's interesting that intellectually, I think we know as parents that that list of strategies, quote unquote, is not getting us the results we want, but we don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. So we think if I do it longer, if I do it louder, if I do it with more tenacity, maybe <laughs> the child will understand how serious I am. But what happens is their pesky behavior gets more anchored in what they do. And here's why, because that's where the connection is. Think about it. When your child is exhibiting these pesky behaviors, we make eye contact. Our voice is intense. We put our phones down. 
we move towards them. And in the child's world, the only thing, the most important thing is the connection that they have with their parents. And if you are convinced as a child that if you poke your little brother and he screams, your mother will drop what she's doing and attend to you, that is a great solution for connecting to mom. Mm -hmm. So we have to reframe our children's behavior and not only their behavior, but our responses to it. So if we look at that pesky behavior as the weed and our responses as the fertilizer, we want to come up with a new suite of strategies that actually promote cooperation, compassion, flexibility, respect, responsibility, um, follow through, honesty, truthfulness, because lecturing, reminding, and nagging is not building those skills and attributes in our children. So everything I teach is about what is it that we want to build in our children, not what is it that we want to get rid of. We want to replace the pesky behavior with useful behavior, with the qualities, the attributes, and the character traits that are going to enhance our child's life and bring peace and harmony into our world when we're living with them. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I'd love to hear you apply it to one of the ones you just said, like the child is uh, poking at his little brother or irritating his little brother and you come typically running and, right. you know, making sure that that's not happening anymore. You might put one in, in time out. Uh, you might take away the game that they're playing. It, you, you might lecture, scream at them, um, hold, you know, your littler child in their, in your arms and, uh, you know, give the stink eye to your older one. So <laughs> if we're now putting a lot of fertilizer on that weed, what, what are we supposed to do instead that would be an example of your duct tape parenting? So my first question to parents is always, well, if you don't want the fighting, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Right. So right. what is it that you want? And most parents will say, well, I want them to cooperate. I want them to get along. And my next question is, so how are you teaching them that? Right. Like if, if you, it's putting one in time out or ye yelling or lecturing or taking something away, actually building that attribute that you want of cooperation. Correct. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's where the growth is right there in a parenting world. It's wait a minute. If the solution to fighting is cooperation, then I have to focus more on how do I help my children learn to cooperate with somebody who sees the world differently, who moves through the world differently? How do I help them learn about conflict resolution? Because there's always going to be conflict when you're in relationship with someone who sees the world differently. But that isn't where the emphasis is. The emphasis is on stop the fighting, stop picking, somebody's to blame, who's in trouble, who's the victim, who's the bully. And all you do is create an environment where you get more of what it is that you're focused on. So instead of paying attention to it, what you ask yourself is how many minutes a day am I introducing my children to the skill sets that will make it easier for them to tolerate a sibling who has high energy when they're a child who likes to spend hours reading. And that's where you start to see the change and the growth in the family and the parent's confidence begins to bloom and blossom because they can see that the change is happening that the children are fighting less, that they're developing the skills that allow them to walk away, to talk respectfully to a their, their sibling. And that's when, that's the power of the change. That's when the parent is truly the change agent in the home. So in that circumstance, then you would not be saying anything while they were fighting no. uh, because then that's feeding the weed but you might work, what, independently with your child who seems like they're having some trouble maybe being vocal to their younger brother in that, state, in that instance and saying, I really need some time to, to read, but later I, at three o'clock, I'll play with you. Or what is it that you're, you're employing yes. to, the, to that child? So I try not to sit the child down and go, hey, let's talk about some strategies you mm -hmm. can use with your brother because the kids looking at me like I'm not interested in this conversation mm -hmm. but if I can weave it into moments for instance yeah. I might say boy I was really annoyed with your brother earlier today but I just decided to walk away and go outside and hug a tree and I felt a lot better about that 
I don't have, I don't have a right to ask him to change. I'm the one that needs to change because I was the one getting upset. Mm -hmm. So part of it is using my own experience as a way to show what it would be like, what I use, mm -hmm. and then to find opportunities throughout the day. This is what I call identify an anchor. And it's a, it's a powerful and simple strategy that we can use to promote these kind of character traits. So for instance, I might see my um, child, my two kids playing together for just a moment. And 10 minutes after they're done, I walk up and I say to each one of them individual, boy, I really appreciate how hard it can be sometimes to play with your brother, but you were so cooperative right there playing cards. So that my child goes, oh, that's what cooperation looks like? Mm -hmm. It looks like me playing cards with my brother? Oh, I kind of like being that kid. Mm -hmm. So I'm not praising. I'm identifying a very particular uh, attribute that I think will help alleviate the fighting. Mm -hmm. And then I'm giving my child a very concrete example of when they were demonstrating that attribute so that they can see the connection easily. Now, imagine if I did this three times a day, every day for seven days. Does it seem reasonable that a child would start to see themselves as a cooperative, flexible kid who didn't fight with their sibling? Absolutely. Right, and that's part of your philosophy is that we're relabeling, we're re-identifying, we're helping our kids to see themselves in a different light instead yeah. of the kid who's always fighting, the yes. kid who's always, you know, leaving the mess on the floor. It's yes. making their identity around a, a positive attribute. Correct. Because if you think about it, the words that we use become the identity our children become. So when they look in the mirror, what they say is, my mom says I'm messy and I'm rude and I'm late and I noodle. Okay. I guess that's who I am. So I better get really good at those things. Right. Well, if I switch that out and say, boy, you're so cooperative and respectful and compassionate and kind, and here are examples of when you demonstrated that, my child is gonna look in the mirror and go, this is who I am, mm -hmm. so this is who I will be more often than not. And mm -hmm. I think that is a, I think that's where parents really wanna live yes. in relationship with their children. I have never met a parent who said, oh no, I love nagging and reminding no. and it's such a thrill for me. Mm -hmm. They just aren't sure how to replace it. Mm -hmm. And we're a culture that believes that every single time a child makes a misstep, it's our job to correct them. And I am not of that theory. I don't think it works. I think it makes a mess. And I think everybody feels that. Instead, it's about spotlighting when our children are showing us who they are at their best. Mm. I, I love that. And that is a quotable and we'll, I'm sure, see that on a meme when I'm developing everything for this podcast. I, I think that's such a good quality. And uh, I, I am very, very much a believer that young people are assets to be developed, not deficits to be managed. So that yeah. really fits with my philosophy as well. And I believe not only are you allowing your child to then see themselves in that positive light, but you change and see them them in that positive light as well. And you start to look for the good. If you look Absolutely. for the good, you'll find the good, right? Absolutely. You know, the more you talk about the things you see in your child that upset you, the more you yes. see the things in your child yes. that upset you. But if you allow yourself to put it aside and say to yourself, I'm not ignoring these pesky behaviors, but I have decided to approach it in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. then it doesn't feel like you're abdicating your role as the leader of your pack, but rather you have an intentional plan to build the assets, the character traits and attributes that you know will benefit your child when you are no longer the primary teacher in their world. And that happens quickly. By nine or 10, you know, our kids are using the world as a way to learn more about themselves. So we have a finite amount of time to really get in there and build that foundation for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now one of the areas that you focus on is our role um, that we often put ourselves in, not because we love it most of the time, as made. Uh, many people don't like having to pick up after their kids or make them, you know, 10,000 different breakfasts or fold their clothes or make their beds. They don't, 
They don't like that, but they also don't like a messy house. They don't like shoes in the middle of their kitchen. Um, they don't want their kid to be unfed. So they wind up doing what needs to get done. Uh, in other words, they don't like being made, and yet many parents are right there with their aprons on. So what is keeping us in the role of maid, and what can we do to get ourselves fired from this position or fire ourselves for good? Okay, so there are a couple of things. The first thing is I think most parents, particularly moms, identify their roles as mothers and fathers as being helpful. Yes. And um, I would challenge everyone to reframe that. And my latest motto is helping is the biggest hindrance in your child's development. Oh my gosh, ouch, right? Yes. Exactly. So oh. the more helpful you are, the more of a deficit you are to the, your child. You, you are you are cutting off their ability to become independent and self-reliant and confident in their own abilities. So we've got to reframe what it means to be an active, engaged parent if we're not doing things for our children all the time. So sure, I could make the sandwiches and pack the backpacks and wake the kids up and pick up their clothes and, and you know, kind of clean up after them, but that's not who I want to be and that's not benefiting my children. I want to be emotionally available to them. I want to make sure that I'm teaching them how to live a satisfying, fulfilling, productive life from 18 to 80. And the only way that I can ensure that they can manage their lives on their own is to introduce them to self skills, home skills, social skills, and life skills. And I believe this is the most underutilized um, part of our parenting world that from the earliest possible moments, we want to start handing over more and more responsibility to the child so that they take ownership in their life, so that they have an investment in their success, so that they look in the mirror and say, my mom and dad believe in me so I can believe in me. And when you believe in yourself, you're willing to take healthy risks. You're willing to say, will you teach me how to do something? You're willing to raise your hand in class and ask for help when you don't understand. There's a sense of confidence that comes from knowing that you can manage first your small world, which is getting up with an alarm clock. Do you like to have the same breakfast every day or do you have an educated palate? Are you a kind of wind pants person or do you, you know, are you a fashionista? And I think in our tendency to get it perfect, get it quick, do it my way, we have completely excluded children from their own development and their own world. Mm -hmm. So it's about kind of stepping out of the way and allowing our children to view the world that we want them to be able to navigate and then introducing them to skill sets in small bite-sized pieces so that they feel successful and they're willing to learn the next thing. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's such an important concept and I am uh, admittedly kicking myself right now about certain things that I feel like I've let kind of go for too long. I've been, um, you know, I, I've shown my kids how to do a lot of things uh, from, from cooking to, you know, cleaning up and, and doing things like that. But one of the areas that I will just admit has gone on too long is that uh, one of my kids is unable to tie his shoes because he has decided he doesn't want to learn. So what do you do in a situation where your child, you, you, you've, offered to uh, help your child learn how to do something. Um, and yet they've said, no, they don't want to learn. And so you've hindered the process by perhaps buying them Velcro shoes. And I am being very vulnerable right now by telling you this. Um, so what would you do in a situation where it doesn't even need to be that example per se, but where you, you want to show your child how to do something, you'd like to work on it, but they've said no. Um, I would listen to the no. I think we have an idea of when kids should be doing things. Mm -hmm. And so we push them before they're ready and they just say, no, I'm not doing it. And then it becomes a power struggle. Right. I, I, here's what I said to parents. If they're potty trained, they're not sucking their thumb and they can tie their shoe by the time they get into Harvard, you, you did your job. 
Okay, good. So, <laughs> so worry sometimes. about things that don't, they, that has nothing to do with the child's character or who he is as a human being. Mm -hmm. It's a skill set. It's, it's irrelevant mm -hmm. because at one moment, the child will trip over the shoelaces and sit down and teach himself or herself how to tie shoes in a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what happened to two of my kids is I just forgot to teach them yes. and they were asking to learn. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll get to that. But first I have to clean the, mm -hmm. the hooves um, and uh, I got to mow the back 40. So I'll get to that. And my daughter was like, I didn't have time to wait for you. I taught myself. I was like, oh, yes. dang. I think that happens more often than not. Mm -hmm. We decide to back off mm -hmm. and just let the kids give it a, a shot to begin with, to allow them to struggle, to let them set the time frame instead of us going, well, everybody else is doing it. It's probably time for you to do it. It's like, mm -hmm. who decided that? Right. So right. if a child says to me, butt out, it's none of your business, I believe them the first time because you know what? If I told somebody to back off and leave me alone and they didn't, I would find a way to get rid of that person in my life. Yeah. And that's what our kids do is they find a way to turn their backs on us because we are not listening to them. Right. It is. I think it is important for us to, to put yourself in the, situ in the same situation as your, your child in many cases. And that if we didn't want to learn a skill and somebody kept egging us on and telling us it was time to learn or putting us in a situation where they're like, well, if you don't know it now, look what situation you're in now. Nobody appreciates that. So I think what you're saying is, is really valid. And I appreciate it because um, I, I certainly dropped the whole idea of, of him tying his own shoes and figured eventually he'll come to me and say, I really want those shoes <laughs> yeah. that have the tie laces <laughs> and, yeah. and, and want to learn. So um, I'm glad that I'm, I'm in, the right, in the right bucket right now. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of the areas we need to attend to is repairing fractured relationships, which is one of the reasons why you say kids are behaving in such ways that are driving us bananas some of the time. You say that this isn't just about spending quality time with our kids. It has to do with a whole new thinking. So can you tell us where to start, how, how we can reframe how we think of our kids and how we can stop worrying so much about the future and what others think of us but based on what our kids are doing, how do we reframe that and have that new way of thinking? Okay. I'll tell you the slogan I came up with because 30 years ago, I was the only person raising kids this way. Mm -hmm. and so I got a, I got a lot of hairy eyeball looks. I got a lot of people asking me what I was doing. I got a lot of people, you know, challenging me and judging me and saying, yeah, but, and I came up with this motto that got everybody to back off and leave me alone. Yes. I, I am raising thinking children and thinking children are very messy. Mm. And yes. that stops everybody because that is the truth. Your mm. child is in a huge learning curve. They are not working on your time frame. They are not a reflection of you. It's our personal prestige that so often mucks up the relationship we have with our kids because we're watching everybody else watch us instead of us watching our children and saying to ourselves, I am my child's advocate. I am my child's support. I am my child's, you know, uh, their champion. I, I don't care what anybody else says. I know my child better than anybody else. I know their rhythms, their temperaments, mm -hmm. how quickly they can move in certain areas of their lives. And it is my responsibility as their parent to ensure that I adjust my ways of teaching to match their ways of learning. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the relationship, these small fractures happen each time we nag, we remind, we override a child's request, we force them to do something they don't want, we say to them, what do you say now? Um, please apologize. What are you sorry for? We're speaking to them as if they're second class citizens. And those hurts, those resentments are what cause those small fractures. Mm 
Mm. As parents, I think we make the mistake of thinking that connecting with their kids is about playing puzzles and going to the park, but those are activities that we do with the people we love. If we're trying to heal a relationship with our child that we know is fractured because there's a lot of tension, the first thing we have to do is go back and apologize for our part in that fracture mm -hmm. to say to our children, I think unintentionally, I have been sending the message to you that you need me, that you are not capable, that I get to boss you around. And for that, I am sorry. So here is what I am willing to do to change this. And I'm asking if you will give me another chance. Now, that might sound hard to a lot of people, but every single time I've said that to my kids, they have forgiven me in a split second. Mm -hmm. Most adults I know would hold a grudge for a week and make me suffer. Mm -hmm. But children do not want to be in conflict with their parents. They want to be close to us. So they are willing to do anything if we are willing to step up and say, I think I've made some mistakes. You know how you've told me that you always like to eat one egg for breakfast and I keep trying to force you to eat a, a granola and yogurt and waffles? I am going to stop doing that. That is is a huge repair in the relationship. Mm -hmm. A child feels heard, they feel validated. It's such a simple thing to do. If we're buying 27 different outfits for the kid, and we have a child who likes to wear the same three pants, if you walked in and said, I am so sorry I have not been listening to you, would you like me to get rid of all this crap you don't like to wear? <laughs> they look at you and go, Yes, please. When you say, the next time we go shopping, would you just pick out the four things you'd like to wear? That is a huge repair in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So imagine all the small things you could do right now today that would bring you closer to your child. And then every day you just kind of recommit to that mindset. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you and your child have the kind of relationship that you dreamed about when you were holding that infant in your arms and you promised it would be different for the two of you. Mm -hmm. And this time it will be. It's a beautiful way of looking at parenting and raising your child. And I, I'm sure that many kids would so appreciate hearing that from their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, in your relationship strategies, you talk about allowing kids to make mistakes, to focus on strengths, as we talked about, creating routines, involving kids in decision-making. I just want to focus on a few of those. One of them, because I know it's an issue that I hear about a lot, is morning routines. The child won't get dressed, one, one won't get up, the other one needs five reminders to go and get this, that, and the other thing. One is always late and misses the bus so that you have to drive them and that makes you more late and you're frustrated, so you nag and remind and prod. So what do we do instead in those real life situations where when we step back, things can get really messy. You can be really late and they and you feel like, well, my kid doesn't, I guess, doesn't want to make the bus and keeps wanting to make me later. They don't care. And you get more and more frustrated. So what, what, what do we do? Okay. So the first step is to identify your child's rhythms. If you have a morning lark, the chances are this is a kid who gets up early, kind of tends to themselves. But if they don't have a kind of schedule that they follow every day, they suddenly have all this time in the morning, but they're not using it well because nobody's taught them how to use it well. Mm -hmm. Instead, somebody's saying, you know, we're, we have to leave in 30 minutes. Go put your shoes on. We're going to leave in 10 minutes. Go get your thing. Now, the kid's been up for two and a half hours, but they're still running late. And that's on us because we haven't taken into account, okay, what needs to happen and how am I going to help my child learn to kind of think about the morning routine. But if you're in charge of it, why would they pay any attention to their morning? They're just listening for the next nagging reminding from you. So we've got to, that's where the less talking and more action comes in. So know your child's routine or rhythms. The other thing is if you have a night owl, this is a kid who's going to get up 10 minutes before you leave. They're going to slide down the banister with the clothes they slept in, grab the leftover breakfast, a backpack. They don't care if there's anything in it and off they go. And that has to be okay with you because that is who they are. 
They are not going to change because you like to get up two hours before and, you know, organize your morning. So know their rhythms and work within the rhythms. The second thing is ask them how they want to set up the morning routine. Stop deciding that you know what the morning routine should look like. You know what it should look like for you, but nobody else on the planet. So sit down with your kids and say, what do you like to do in the morning? Do you like to eat before you get dressed? How much time do you think you need? And then we practiced on the weekends kind of timing how long it took the kids mm. to do certain things so that they had real data they could use. And I wasn't kind of guessing what worked and what didn't. Then the third thing is to decide what your bottom line is. I said, I will be in the car at 730. And if you are in the car, I will drive you to school. I didn't say, well, if you're dressed and your teeth are brushed and you've eaten your breakfast and you've made your bed and you've washed the dishes and you've got your backpack, then I'll drive you to school. I said, I will drive you to school if you're in the car. I don't care if you're fed, watered, dressed, hosed down, dirty, stinky, don't care. My job is to do what I said and what I will do is drive you because you can't drive. But the rest of the morning, if I have taught you how to do all those things, you are now in charge of managing it. And you know what? It only takes two days of going to school in your pajamas or without your breakfast or forgetting your backpack before suddenly your children are going, uh, this does not work for me. Mm. So I need to change things. And then the magic happens. But if you're in charge of their morning, it is never going to work for anybody in the family. Mm -hmm. So we've got to invite them in. Then we've got to say, this is the threshold. I'm willing to do this at this time. I've taught you how to take care of yourself. So I'll see you in the car and then you go. Now, you can't leave a four-year-old home or a nine-year-old home. So we came up with as a family that they would pay me as if I was the taxi service. And so they'd bring their $3 out because they were late. And I'd say, you got to pay up because mm -hmm. in the real world, you'd have to call a cab if you were carpooling with other people. They wouldn't sit there and wait or come into your apartment and go, come on, you got to get dressed. Time to get out of bed. They'd leave. <laughs> So it's my job to adequately represent to my children what they can expect from the outside world based on their choices. So I'm doing them a favor by not nagging them or getting mad at them, but by saying, okay, so the morning didn't work out so well today. The good news is tomorrow will be a new day. And you can make any changes you want to your schedule to make it more appealing to you because that is when people change. Mm -hmm. It's when your child is inconvenienced, then they are motivated to change. But if you make life easy, you're not going to see any change at all. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and, you know, cause you talk so much about needing to train your kids, you know, just so that they have the skills that they need, but understanding that even as you're training them, they're going to make mistakes and that's okay too, because they're going to learn from those mistakes. Now, before we get into our top tip, um, I wanted to ask you, you have a five day uh, duct tape challenge okay. and you say you know, there's you, you provide these sort of tough questions for us um, you know what do you want your kid to be like at 18 and will this behavior matter in two weeks and will this behavior actually matter in a year that they're late for school today or they have messy hair and so we've been doing all these types of of corrections because we don't want our kid to be seen as rude or unkempt or terrible in some way. And we jump into those sibling ri rivalries and we drive our kids homework to school because of, of all these different reasons that we've talked about. And you say, stop it, stop yeah. it for five days. So yeah. tell us about that five day duct tape parenting challenge. And, and what do, what do we do as your parenting audience right now to employ it? Okay, so it's called the Do Nothing, Say Nothing Week. And let me just start out by saying it doesn't mean that you're not parenting. It means that for seven days, you are not going to employ any of the strategies that make things worse in your home. The nagging, reminding, lecturing, punishing, counting, time outing, threatening, saving, bribing. If those worked, I would be out of business. Mm -hmm. They do not work. So what will happen if you stop all of that? So here's the first thing that happens. A parent's brain freezes and they say, what? Well, right, what my kids are going to be wild animals. They're going to be watching TV all the time. And, and I say, how do you know that? Do you have any facts to back that assumption up? And they go, well, 
No. I'm like, well, okay, so you're living in a fiction. You're making your parenting decisions based on fiction, not fact. That's a dangerous place to be making parenting decisions. So this is a fact gathering exercise. It's so that you can look around and say to yourself, if I step back and I allow my children to step up, what happens? Well, the first couple of days could be really messy because the kids depend on you and all of your reminding and all of your cues and all of your prompts. But as they get used to the fact that you're not doing that, their brains turn on and suddenly they go, wait, I know what I have to do. And they start to do it. And you start to see your child in a completely new way. Like, wow, I didn't even know my kid could do that. I didn't even know they knew about that stuff. And it changes the way that you see them. And as they begin to show you what you're, they're capable of, they start to feel really good about themselves. They have a voice for the first time in the family. They're taking ownership of their days and the skill sets. And now you've, this is the beginning of a brand new relationship. You have literally redefined your role, which is to consistently step back and observe, allow your child time to make some mistakes and course correct, move in a positive direction towards a successful outcome, and you get to step in only when you identify, wait a minute, I have not shown my child where the toaster is, which is why they cannot make their favorite toast. <laughs> okay, that is an easy solution. So I don't need to be getting into a power struggle every day with my kid about the toast anymore. I have figured out where the log jam was. Mm -hmm. So imagine how peaceful this is when all you're doing is focusing on the support and training that you can give your child. And imagine the peace you will feel when you're not nagging, reminding, lecturing, timeouting, threatening, counting, pulling your hair out. What am I going to do? Can I send him away with the UPS man? Why does he keep doing this to me? It's like all of those thoughts disappear. And what you're left with is, oh my gosh, this kid is amazing. Look at how insightful they are. Look at how creative they are. Look at what great problem solvers they are. Look at how patient and ten tenacious they are. And that that is a game changer in families. Do you find that your work, your encouragement of doing a, a family plan that you talk about or a, a, a family meeting is what is needed prior to doing that? Do we somehow alert the kids to this change that we are going to do so that they are on board and know what's going on and, and, and maybe know what it is that they need in order for this all to work? Yes. So the first thing you want to do is kind of assess. If you're talking about a four-year-old, you can't say, well, it's time for you to get up by yourself. And, but you can look at, gee, I really think my child would be able to do all of these things without my reminding them um, and prompting them. So you would start there. If it was a 12-year-old, it's like, they really know how to do anything. I just can't control my mouth. So that's <laughs> the first thing you want to do is kind of assess. And then you sit them down and say, hey, you know what? I think I'm the problem in the morning because this is what I do. And then you do yourself so that the kids kind of giggle and go, oh, that is what you sound like, mom and dad. Like, oh my gosh, you really are that horrible. And you're like, I know, I don't want to do that anymore. So it's always on me. I'm never saying to the kids, you know what? You guys need to step up and start pulling your weight. It's always about I messed up, mm -hmm. so I'm going to do the changing because I'm modeling for my children taking responsibility for their behavior. So there's teaching going on right away when I say I'm the problem, so this is what I'm going to do different. How would it be if I left you alone in the morning and I just let you get yourself ready in whatever way felt right for you? And I promise you that I will drive you to school at eight o'clock in the morning. Would you like to try that for a couple of days and see what we learn about each other? Mm -hmm. Because I think I'm the problem in the morning and I would like to have a happier, more peaceful morning. Would you? And the kids are like, uh, yeah, we're a little tired of all this, you know, chatting you're doing as well uh, and directing. And then you give it a go. Now you step in if it's morally or physically dangerous, obviously. And it's not that you're not parenting. It's that you are putting down the strategies you know in your heart and your mind do not work. Mm -hmm. And you're saying to yourself, I will find the courage 
to watch and to learn this week. And I will gather information that will help me put a plan together that meets the needs of my child where they are developmentally with a trajectory that will lead them in a direction that is satisfying for all of us in the family. And for me, that was a really fun endeavor. That was something I could get excited about as a mom and as an adult. And I found that my children were equally as excited about this new way of being in relationship with each other. So exciting. Love it. Okay. At this point, I'd like to ask you for your top tip. What is your top tip that you would want people to come away with so that they help their kids to become confident, responsible adults and you stop yammering and correcting and nagging and, and uh, punishing? Okay. So a couple of things, but they all tie together. One, you are the leader of your pack. So act like a leader. Know what your bottom line is, know where your boundaries are and be clear about them. Follow through with them so that you build trust in your children so that when they're teenagers, they believe what you say. That's the first thing. The second thing is to parent the child who will be 24 in a hot second. Mm. Parenting is not about what happens for you between the ages of zero and 18. Parenting is about what happens for our children between 18 and 80. Mm. So ask yourselves every single time you make a parenting decision, is this going to help my child create a satisfying, fulfilling, enriched, happy life between 18 and 80? And if it isn't, then I need to reassess why I'm doing it. Is it because I want compliance right now? Is it because I want to feel a sense of control? Is it because I think people are watching me and judging me? Or am I doing it because I know that this is the best decision to make for my child in this moment that will serve them when they are 24? And I think if we use that as our true north, we're going to, parenting is going to become much simpler, much more enjoyable, and far more effective. Mm. So great. Thank you so much for that. Give us the resource of the week. Where can we go to get more information about you and all the great things you're doing? So there are two places. You can go to the website, vickihofel.com, and we have hundreds of blogs on every sing single topic. And we have formatted them so that we can identify the challenge and give you a new way of looking at it first and then some strategies to try to see if you can get some positive change. And the other place to go for kind of ongoing information is my Facebook page. There are all kinds of videos where I talk about the challenges of the week. We hear from different parents on the things that have worked for them. So you start to feel like you're a part of a community and that you can get support from other people who are raising their kids using this less is more approach. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so very much. I, I loved this interview. I, I love what you're all about. Really saying to yourself and to others, let's have faith in our kids. They will rise to the occasion and let's stop interfering so much with the process because once we do that, then they can become the beautiful people that they, they are meant to become, that they can become, that they have all the potential to become if we just shut our mouths and yes. let it happen. <laughs> well, thank you so very much for being on the show today. I'm so glad you were here. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends, I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. We can go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash Dr. Robin. I'm also on Instagram at Dr. Robin Silverman. I'll be going back and forth with Vicki and I will be tagging her on social media. I'll be creating those memes so that you can share them because my goodness, didn't Vicki say so many amazing things today that you're like, yes, I've got to remember that. I got to cut it out and put it up on my refrigerator. I will be doing that for you. And if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it so other people can learn about these outstanding solutions that Vicki provides and they will be using them in their own homes. I truly appreciate it. 
That's all the time we have for today. My fellow parents, leaders, and educators, thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. So many great podcasts up there. And the show notes to this podcast will be up there as well. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, you've got this. You're here. You're getting the information you need. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. Perhaps you heard something today and you said, oh my gosh, I've been totally doing that. So many of us have in all different ways. And you can change it. You can change it today. I see you. I'm right there with you. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you're 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.